we've heard so much about this coming invasion, this new invasion from Russia in the east. This morning, we asked retired four-star Navy Admiral James Tavridis what the offensive will look like. On the Russian side of this, yeah, we're going to see a lot of piece parts moving on the battlefield. Don't look for some sweeping, cohesive battle plan. On the Ukrainian side, look for endless resistance, Willie. They are here to stay. And, and let's close on a snapshot of Mariupol, uh, mm. a doomed city, but where you see defenders like at the Alamo. Um, standing and delivering for their country. Yeah. Magnify ah. that through the Ukrainian At that steel forces. factory we're looking at right now, that's yeah. their Alamo. It is their Alamo, and we ought, to, we ought to honor it. So, Admiral, we've heard for a while now that this battle in the Donbass is going to look different than what we have seen to this point in the war, which a lot of it has been urban warfare, sort of guerrilla fighting, but this is going to be more set-piece combat. Explain to viewers exactly what that means. Are these going to be tanks lined up? What sort of numbers are we talk about? What sort of artillery is going to be used? Yeah, think about uh, the revenge of geography. In other words, you can change a lot of things on the battlefield. You can't change the terrain. And thus, as you point out correctly, Jonathan, out of the cities onto the plains of Ukraine, it's a vast, think Kansas. And um, as a result of that, that armor can move, uh, both the tanks, the armored personnel carriers, and yes, what the Russians envision is a sweeping set piece kind of battle like we haven't seen since the Second World War. We'll see, A, if they can deliver that, and B, Ukrainians have plenty of firepower that yeah. we've given them to put uh, a real sense of uh, d defense in front of the Russians. So it, it's going to be quite striking to watch. About 10 years ago, when I was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, I spent a fair amount of time with my counterpart, General Nikolai Makarov, and he would talk to me endlessly about how the Russians were going to professionalize, how they were going to get out of the conscript business, how they were going to improve mm -hmm. their logistics, they were going to improve their technology. And we watched that and saw some of that happening. But let me tell you, Joe, until the bullets fly, you don't know what kind of military you actually have. Interesting. And by the way, President Xi, as he looks at the world, right. he's got to be asking himself, I wonder if what my generals and admirals are telling me is about as accurate as what Putin so was obviously told by his. Part of our conversation this morning with retired Admiral James Stavridis. And joining us now, live former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, now Director of the Institute for International Studies at Stanford, and an NBC News International Affairs Analyst, Michael McFall. Ambassador McFall, always great to have you with us. Um, be interested to hear your assessment of what Admiral Stavridis said there, if you want to add to it or amend any of it, what you think the next few days, weeks, and months, perhaps years, look like in the east of Ukraine. Well, he's the former admiral, I'm the former ambassador, so I'll defer to him on the military tactics. Uh, everything I hear from both American officials and Ukrainian officials uh, support what he just said. I think it's important to underscore we've given the Ukrainians an amazing amount of, of weapons to prepare for this battle, and yet uh, they are worried that they do not have enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's just the difference between fighting on the battlefield and supplying those fighting on the battlefield. Uh, the second thing I would add to that, you, you notice we don't really have a great fidelity on Ukrainian casualties in the fighting before, right? So they won the Battle of Kiev. That will go down as a, a major historical moment in the birth and the rebirth of the Ukrainian nation. I have no doubt that when history books are written, rewritten about Ukraine, this will be a major moment. But we don't know how costly that was. And, and what I'm looking for in the, in the coming days is will we see the asymmetries that look like we, they are on paper play out in actual uh, wins and losses on the battlefield? Uh, let, let me ask you, uh, Ambassador, about a uh, conversation we had earlier this morning with a friend of ours, a friend of the show, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, obviously from Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Sachs suggested that the United States needed to do more in the area of diplomacy, that we're too focused on fighting this war, too focused on winning this war. Um, and we asked, how do you negotiate with Vladimir Putin? He said you can negotiate with third countries for the most part. What, what, is, what is your take on that? Is there more we could be doing diplomatically? No. 
It takes two to tango, Joe. You can't you can't want diplomacy if the other side doesn't want to talk. And I just, you know, I urge people to listen to the last time Vladimir Putin spoke on camera. It was about three or four days ago. Uh, he said the diplomacy is at a dead end because he wants to take more territory in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He's made it clear as day. And no words are going to stop his tanks at this moment. Uh, wars tend to end in two ways. Either one side wins or there's a stalemate on the battlefield. And right now, we have neither of those conditions. It's just crystal clear to me. I watch Russian television, read what he says, listen to his people pretty closely, that they want to connect Crimea to Donbass, and that that's what this war is about. And maybe then, once they have to achieve that, they'll start talking. But until then, they're going to keep fighting, and, and no amount of diplomats and third parties and the United Nations will not change Putin's fundamental calculation. Well, he's committed war crimes. I'm, I'm just curious your reaction to reports that he's actually awarded medals to troops that were accused of committing war crimes in Bucha. Doesn't that doesn't that really uh, reveal his mindset in a way that um, you now any diplomatic talk uh, would not? Yes, I, I mean it is a tactic of his horrible, heinous war. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes I don't even like to use the word war, right? Because why do we call killing innocent civilians in Mariupol, wiping out the city completely? That's not war. That's right. that's something else. But it is part of the strategy and I, I because it puts pressure on President Zelensky. Imagine what it feels like to be President Zelensky and to be sitting in Kiev and not being able to protect your citizens in cities like Mariupol. And so it's part of a conscious strategy. Strategy. It's a war crime. It's it's terrorism. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, I'm not a military. I'm not a, the international lawyer, but it sure looks like terrorism to me. Uh, and it will continue, as I said, until there is a stalemate on the yeah. battlefield, or one side wins. I predict stalemates probably more likely. But it won't, he's not going to change while he's still uh, gaining territory. And right now, Putin is gaining territory. Yeah, maybe rather than war, he is decimating and eliminating the people of Ukraine one by one. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, some, some experts along the way have said the end game or one end game, if this is one, is just to wear the Russians down, keep fighting, keep supplying arms, weapons, support, munitions, so that the Russians are worn down. I just, I don't really, does that really end it, though? Because uh, I think it doesn't give Putin any way to save face. That's number one. And the other thing that's come up on this show today in the first three hours is the possibility of a Ukrainian no-fly zone, like providing Ukraine with the ability to create their own no-fly zone. Is that feasible? Well, on the second question, uh, they already have some of that. Let's give them mm -hmm. credit. The S-300s uh, system that we j we helped to negotiate from Slovakia, that will help. But it's m my assessment, again, I'm not an expert, but I listen, I right. talk to Ukrainian government officials every single day, uh, uh, and their attitude is, thank you, and now give us more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, now do more. Those are great sanctions, now do more. And that's because, and they don't feel like they have the capabilities to do a no-fly zone now yet, but they they want to get to that. Um, and with respect to the attrition war, that's a great question. I don't have a great answer. Uh, tragically, they could just keep fighting along some border. By the way, as they did uh, starting in 2014 until this moment. Remember. The war started in 2014 mm -hmm. um, and, and just kind of ground, uh, it's been grinding along until this escalation. Tragically, that might be an outcome as well. Mr. Mr. Ambassador, we've heard growing speculation in recent days that May 9th, which is the commemoration in Russia of the former Soviet Union's victory over Germany in World War II, uh, could be an important landmark for this conflict, too. We, you know Russia, you know Putin. We know that he likes historical markers. The Ukrainians have warned Washington that, that might be something where Putin tries to mark. The White House, less certain. What do you think? 
Well, it's getting a lot of attention, and, and most certainly May 9th is the most important date uh, in Russian history right now. I attended the May 9th uh, celebrations as ambassador twice and watched the thousands of Russian soldiers and all their equipment uh, go through Red Square. It is a major event, uh, and kind of even religious. I think it's hard for Americans to understand how important the end of World War II is for Russians. And, and by the way, Ukrainians and Georgians and Estonians they all fought too, uh, but they lost millions of people in that war and they defeated fascism, right? And real fascists, not the, not alleged fascists like they're fighting in Ukraine. So Putin is, and, and his propagandists are trying, trying to tie those threads together, right? We defeated fascism in 1945. We're going to defeat them again uh, in the year 2022. I personally don't think it's, it's viable looking at the calendar. I think the war in Donbass will be continuing, but it, it, it creates creates a, a moment in history. And, and remember, whenever you hear people use save face, Putin needs mm. a win, uh, all those things, remember, he gets to decide what that is. Right. It's not actual people that he's saving face from, right? He's not going to have people like you on TV criticizing, well, did we win or did we not? Mm -hmm. No, he gets to decide what is victory. And he could declare victory any day. Um, and, you know, it, the fall of Mariupol, if that happens before May 9th, the connecting of that board, that, that, that the, the land bridge, right? They call it Nova Russia, uh, that might be a marker why he says by the time you get to May 9th let's now negotiate seriously so